we start we start our weekly weekly colloquium and of theoretical physics also today the talk will do not be about physics uh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, dr Lukas Luskowiak I mean, no not everything is physics I don't think that philosophy is physics or the nature of the law of physics and the most phenomenal. We derive all the other stuff. If you can from derive the uh, works of Newton uh, or Freud, I will compression. Uh, this is and maybe, maybe even less. If you can derive replication of DNA, I will compression. Uh, anyway, um, actually, that was a good uh, that was a good point because today today we are having a, a speaker who is uh, not working in, in physics but is working in. Uh, Biomedical imaging is uh, as far as I understand, right? Yes. So we will have uh, we will have a talk actually about uh, uh, machine vision and deep learning today. Okay, the round is yours. Absolutely. Like that, or we want? It is good. No, no, it was, no, it was better. This is better. All right. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Lucas, and I will talk to you about machine learning and deep learning. And as for the introduction here, I was uh, in, invited here to talk about my PhD, which is directly connected with biomedical engineering because uh, it's in this field. Uh, but I didn't want to score you with the all medical and biomedical stuff, so I decided to talk to you about the machine vision and deep learning. This is like the old master here, and this is the newbie, so that's the hot topic that uh, is really introduced in the, in the image processing recently, or a few years, a few years ago. And we'll, we will talk about the cancer uh, and which of these methods can really uh, win with cancer or deal with cancer. So. To go further, uh, first, but diagnostics, not curing. Uh, well, mostly, yeah, sure, to be sure specific. Uh, so, first of all, I will talk a little, a little bit about myself and my PhD. Then, because it's directly connected with digital pathology, I'll introduce you into this topic. And then we'll go through the, mm, this competition of machine vision and deep learning. And later on, when you will have the primary understanding of these two, we can go through the some case studies and uh, summarize uh, summarize the, the whole event. Okay, so I'm from Knowledge Institute of Biocybernetics and Biomedical Engineering, and that's located in Warsaw, in Freudena Street. And so it's quite easy to contact me if you want after this presentation. Uh, and uh, I'm in the laboratory of processing and analy analysis of microscopic images. That's uh, uh, the head of the laboratory is Anna Kuczynska, and the uh, whole scientific research that I'm doing is because of her, and uh, I'm totally grateful for her uh, involvement in that research. And uh, mostly we were involved in the application of quantitative methods for the Microscopic images, like presented here, we have the fibroblast, we analyze the movement of the fibroblast, and also, like for example, a color standardization of the images from the microscope. Like the, we established some normalization methods based on the uh, color to size, and like here or here, visible on the slide. But later on, we uh, moved to the digital pathology and the quantitative pathology. So we analyze the samples like here. We we'll talk about this more in, in a few minutes. Uh, so we have the very big slides, and we want to do something with them. Mostly, we want to quantify the cell, uh, establish the, um, the, the, the the diagnosis, as the professor said, uh, and we want to analyze them in the more precise way that the pathologists can do with microscopes. Okay, so going further with my PhD that uh, I defended this uh, this spring, 
Well, this is a, a long title, but what we want to uh, really focus on here is that it's uh, about the breast cancer and uh, this long word immunohistochemically staying samples. So uh, I will introduce you with some of the pathology specific uh, staining, and that was the um, precise, precise goal of my PhD. Uh, the, the PhD was based on six publications that you can see here, and they are available online. So if you want to go through them, just see what I get. Okay, so the final results of the PhD was, uh, and the last publication was about this Chisel system, and that was designed to assist the, the pathological evaluation. And as you can see here, it, it was uh, constructed with some blocks that could be substituted with another method. So this is not the very specific, it was implemented very specific segmentation method, but it could be substituted with some novel one when uh, some newer methods or different data sets could be processed. So the main achievement of this uh, was the implementation of this algorithm and that the tool really allowed to increase the reproducibility, comparability, and objectivity of the assessment. And so that was just done and everything was clear, but you don't know how important that was. So I will introduce you with the all basis of that. So first of all, breast cancer was the whole idea, the whole topic of, the, of my PhD. And why it's very important? Well, it's one of the most common cancerous cause of death. And uh, the, there are some subtypes, and the dependence of the subtype is the, uh, the whole procedure of the diagnosis, and the, um, later on, the treatment is based on the subtypes of this breast cancer. We have like the progesterone um, markers, the uh, estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, HER2 and K67, those are markers. And based on the positive or negative results, we have different treatments. But everyone actually, like the big RR, the big scientific communities, are um, taking care of that. So we focus on some very specific idea. We focus on the marker of COX-P3. This is basically used in science, not in the common practice. And these protein markers are important for the regulation of the immune response and the T regulatory cells. So they mark the T regulatory cells. And it's different staining from the typical uh, hematopsin and elgin that gives the pink and blue um, images as a result. Uh, we had the special immunohistochemical staining that is automatic in direct is very specific. And these are the samples from the images from my PhD that we have the stains of that, this is the brown marker, and hematoxin, which is the blue marker here. Uh, so we have the brown and blue cells, but these are like really zoomed in. Like we had a lot of them in the samples. I show you that in later on. But this was the objects of interest for my algorithm to segment and to uh, quantify in the slide. Okay, so but how the whole tissues are prepared? So first of all, there is the biopsy. Mm -hmm. it is the taking of the uh, with the needle taking the tissue from the from the patient, and then they are put in the blocks, the paraffin blocks that are solidified with the cold temperature. Then they can be cut from the microtome. This is the microtome, this is the cutting of the microtome. And then they are put on the water to make them um, flat. They are taken, took out on the glass slides and then they are prepared for staining. So the, these are the automatic stainers that could be used for typical hematoxin elgin staining or the Okay, this is the two types of the specimen, specimen that we could handle. So the whole size images are the big blocks of tissue. That, that, those are the cuts that uh, are typically made. But for science, we also make the tissue microarrays. So we, the pathology structures. And the tissue microarrays are the samples from multiple uh, organs, for multiple patients, uh, and they are quite common in the scientific community because they um, provide 
multiple samples with the same staining, the staining intensity is uh, more homogeneous in this way. So, uh, what pathologists do with these samples? Well, we put them under the microscope and they look pro, 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 and they get tired very easily because they look pro samples the whole day. And what they are the, looking for? Well, they're looking for the markings for the diagnosis and uh, the, they can make some prognosis from them and then establish treatment. But how they are quantifying? Well, they're not quantifying. They are just assuming that there is some percentage of the same um, cells or say nuclei in the samples. And it's very rough assumption. Also, the manual evaluation is very subject to error and really time consuming. Like for the typical healthy tissue, it could take a very small amount of time, like 10 seconds. But for the quite problematic or the sample that really should be quantified, it can take a lot, a lot of longer time, like for example, five or 10 minutes for one sample. And also, this is very limited with the field of analysis. Like here, you can see the example of the fields uh, that the pathologists can see looking through the samples. As you can see, there is a lot of sample that is left on. Uh, unseen uh, in the fire modification. So the main idea is that the manual evaluation is not reproducible. And uh, the novel digital pathology uh, was introduced when the digital scanners of the whole slide images so it was were introduced. So we can put the glass slides in the scanner and uh, receive the, the whole image. Uh, as a result, like the digital image of that. But they are not simple images, they are different types. So we have the um, pyramid of, of images from the very deep, uh, high resolution images to the miniatures of them. And uh, this is basically to make the process of looking through the virtual sites easier and more to, to do it more quickly, more efficiently. Uh, on, the, on the computer. So um, this allows also the technicians, the, the, the engineers like me, to uh, to access the virtual site uh, on the multiple levels, on the multiple scales, uh, like seen here on the slide. Okay, so the idea of automation of evaluation and applying image processing for the digital pathology was to reproduce the to make the evaluation reproducible, make it faster, see the full area and quantify the cells in the full area of the of the cell of the tissue, and make it quantitative and objective. But it's not an easy task because we can have high variability of uh, different stainings of different uh, visual idea of the tissue because of the, when we have different uh, disease, when it, we have different markers, and even when we use different scanners, the same slide could be seen very differently. Like this is not only the um, problem of white balance, but it is also the problem of color normalization. So to sum up this part, um, the importance of this subject is that the automation of the of digital pathology and the quantitative pathology is that the analysis of cell nuclei are staying different and different ways of subject in much uh, it, it, it is the um, subject of much research and I focus on the method to assist the, the quantitative evaluation so I focus on quantifying the cells quantifying the nuclei marked with some specific marker. And we have two approaches. So we have the machine vision and deep learning that we can use for that. So I I have no idea if you are using machine vision or deep learning mm, here. I assume no. Yeah, I, 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 I was doing that. That's why I want to introduce you with some ideas, actually. And so the machine vision is the old way. It's the, the um, 
process acquiring, processing, analyzing the images in the standard way, standard procedures, and that were formed years ago. But it may seem simple, like thresholding. We have the original image, and we can apply very different thresholding uh, methods. As you can see, the light the light here is not homogeneous. We have the more gray, more dark values here, and the lighter here. So different thresholding algorithms put the boundary here, and they are not uh, correctly segmented here. The, the, the letters are not correctly segmented here. Why is it important? Well, for example, for OCRs, this is the first step, the thresholding of the image to distinguish the letters and to make them automatically um, seen by the by the algorithm. Okay, so we have the edge detection, like very simple algorithm that can provide us with a lot of knowledge for the object shape, right? So we have the, for example, here is the kind of filter that can establish the, mm, the, the, the boundary of the positive uh, has a boundary here of so the image. Okay, the, another basic idea histogram manipulation. Like here, you cannot see the object, and by simply simply normalizing the histogram of this image, you can distinguish the specific texture that is visible here. Okay, filtering, like blurring or sharpening. This is very basic idea, but very useful. Also, the segmentation. We can use very different algorithms for segmentation, like applied here. This is for uh, from Stippy uh, package that uh, these methods could be implemented in minutes. Gray level coherence matrix. This is very useful for uh, pattern recognition, for texture recognition, or texture analysis. Also, local binary patterns. This is the idea of the uh, for the establishing of the patterns, this comparison of the patterns. This is a histogram of the local binary, binary patterns. So you're looking for very small uh, windows here and compare them through the images. Gabber filter, this is another feature that could be extracted and it's very uh, in line with the human eye vision. Okay, so the, all those object properties after the segmentation, after the preprocessing, could be concatenated and put to the feature vector that then could be <laughs> the input for the, for example, simple neural network. This works for the classifier for the um, for this feature vector that we want to use for the classification. So this could be any other classifier like the decision tree or SVMs, any other. So to sum up this machine vision approach. It is very controlled because the user has to know what he's looking for and apply very specific methods here. So it's user driven. And it really doesn't need a very big data set. It will work perfectly well for two images as well as 20,000 images. And, and it's very quick to develop. We have the packages for that. We have already implemented a lot of methods and also the implementation, our implementation of the methods also could be very quick. But it's a very focused approach. Like uh, you cannot have the achieve the correlation of some unknown features here. Like this is very specific for the for this approach that you you have to know what you are looking for. On the other hand, there is the deep learning method, and as you probably have some idea that the deep learning is the part of artificial intelligence, which is a part of machine learning, and then deep learning is within the neural network area. And what is different from for the deep learning apart from the traditional learning art algorithm? Well, it works really well with the big data. Like we have when we have a lot of data here, it really shows the, the, the value of deep learning, the performance uh, is incredible. Incredible, but it's not only data, it's labeled data. So we have to we need the labeled data set and that are very big with the and very specific label. So in case of images, when we are uh, talking about classification, it's easier than with the segmentation, especially in the uh, histopathology. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, this is the supervised learning that uh, provides the classification. So we have, for example, the image with the um, class, like for example, we have the picture of the cat and we have the label of cat and then we can make the classification. Then we have a lot of data set with cat so we can do supervised learning. There is also the um, idea of using the raw data, but it's um, more complex and this is uh, well, less established here. So the typical, the basic types of neural networks and the standard new neural network when every neuron is connected with every other neuron uh, in the previous and next uh, layer. And the convolutional neuron, neural networks are the idea that we will be talking about because they are used for images. And their current neural networks are typically used for speech and text recognition. So the success of deep learning, as you probably know, the use of GPUs that provided the success of the deep learning because the idea was there before, but the computational parameters were not enough at the at the time, and the GPUs provided that. Okay, so the convolutional neural networks provide all that that was done before with the classical image processing. The pre-processing of the images, the segmentation, the post-processing and classification, it's all inside neural network. So we have the input image, we put it in the network, and then we get the result, like for example, classification of the image. Okay, a few examples of the um, tasks that we can um, use the CNN for. So we have the image classification, we have object detection and localization, object segmentation, and apart from that, very different from what I'm doing, facial verification, recognition, both estimation style. But what I am more connected with is the image localization, the object localization and detection. So the classification becomes the simplest task is that putting the label of car on that image. But the classification with localization is putting the label on the image and also <laughs> putting the bounding box on the on the car. So we have the localized car in the, in the image. Of course, we are doing that with the pathology, but this is more simple, more mm, clear example. And also the detection is when we have multiple objects and we want to find them all. The whole idea of the convolutional neural network is how they are doing that. Well, the basis is the, it's in the name, it's the convolution. So they there are multiple filters throughout the CNNs, and they are convolved with the image, and they later on there also they the feature vectors are concatenated with, uh, with each other, and then um, as a result, we can have some out. I, I don't want to go into detail of the CNN work. This will be another seminar for that. But uh, for the whole idea, how to present the whole idea is that the, there are multiple filters that are not established by the user, but they are learned from the data by the network. So we have the number of filters that defines and the size of the filters that define that is defined by the user, but the what is inside the filters, what they are doing with the images is driven by the, is derived from the data by the network, by the learning algorithm. So you can have, you can ask the question, is it a black box? Because we are putting the image and we are receiving some classification later on, and we don't know what's going on inside. And this is the reason that why the clinicians have such disregard for such methods. But this is not entirely true, as we can now, we have some methods to really go into the CNS. And we know that the first layers are filters for establishing the boundaries, the, the lines, the colors, as you can see here. And this is the example from the publication about the face recognition. So in the middle layers, we have some objects. And the final layer, consists of the whole face. So the whole image or the whole object is considered in the final layers that we're looking for. 
And also the explainable AI idea, the, the whole scope of that is really developing. We have at least these three examples of the explainable AI that can show which part of the image in, was really the basis of the classification performed by the, by the network. So we can explain the decision made by the network. And we can also use that for our digital pathology to show pathologies which part of the tissue was crucial for that decision. And what I wanted to point out here also is that the whole idea is highly interesting for the machine learning. So we have some idea, we called it, and then we experiment and we have another idea and establish the code again and then experiment again and again and again and again. So it's harder to predict the, what will make the model better. We have some idea, of course, but we know where the way to, to, to achieve that. But it, it is an iterative process to get there. So to compare those two approaches, we have the deep learning that is that is very big advantage here that the features are self-selected, but and it is that data driven, not the user driven. But we need a big data. We need big amount of, in my case, images, and those need to be a labeled images. So we need some mask or we need uh, classes for the images. And usually it takes long to train those models. But this is the broader approach. This is another advantage that we can establish some connection that we actually didn't know about. So we don't have to look for something. We can accidentally uh, discover something here. Okay, so you have the basic idea of machine vision and what is deep learning and what are the um, basis of that. So then I, I want to show you some case studies, maybe challenges that uh, the challenges that uh, I encountered through my scientific work. The first one is the finding punches. Mm, punches are called the discourse of uh, tissue here. And, and one of my tasks throughout the, my scientific work was to ident identify the samples in these tissue microarrays. This is quite complicated task because the location is the only mm, significant part here. Like we don't have the markings here. We don't have the numbering on the slide. The only the location of this core of this punch can really mm, uh, co cooperate with the mm, with the mm, identification of the patient or with the patient. So there is lack of information, but Mm, I established the method for identifying the course throughout the. This is quite simple example, I know, but it, it works well. Um, and this is good for presentation here. Uh, like the parser of RPL DMA. And I established here, sorry, this is in Polish, I, but the whole idea is that this is the pre processing. And here we have the thresholding. We have a simple threshold in here, and the morphological, morphological operations is also part of the uh, standard image processing. So I apply standard image processing to achieve quite good results at segmenting and finding those punches here. So it was unnecessary to apply the deep learning because I I should I I would have to label them to, to manually segment them to manually. Pinpoint the location of each punch for, I don't know, one, two, three, four images uh, to establish the data. And establishing this thresholding algorithm really took less time. Also, very recent project that is not published yet is the uh, ology for the, uh, for the um, cooperation of my institute. And that we uh, analyze the eggs of the um, birds, and they are also the features that um, we have to find the egg on the on the on the whole image. And also applying the simple thresholding was easiest 
upper out here because we didn't have the label state. Okay, so challenge number two is the nuclear segmentation in immunochemical images. Uh, and this is the part of my PhD. This is the pre processing part. So we had different kinds of samples, like here. We, had, we, can, we can see the strong brown stain here. This is more very blue here. Like the contrast stain is very um, sufficient here. And this is more like the uh, average example here. So distinguishing the brown in these two examples was quite easy. But uh, here, brown nuclei stain is merging with the brown uh, influence in the background. So I also applied adaptive thresholding. So this is the kind of thresholding that is very locally uh, applied. Uh, and also, I received quite good results for a few methods. I finally decided to use one of them. This is the F score of the, of the best method. As you can see, it's well over 85. And this is the, the sample that example here, or taken for example here. This is the original image. This is the annotation that I uh, was provided with uh, from the pathologist. As you can see, the uh, markings are the points of the, um, the nuclei are marked with points because this is for the detection uh, algorithm. So this is the method that I finally used in my implementation. This is the browsing method for the uh, thresholding, and it was it. This is the final result, the F F1 score, and the DCR MCP for that. It, it was the, the best of the tested methods. And as you can see here, the unit and the chain are the deep learning methods. So my simple method achieved better results from the tested data than, than the deep learning methods. That was, well, quite surprising, but it was pleasant surprise. Also on the other data set that we tested, we also achieved better, that, uh, better scores than the uh, two deep learning methods apply. So, pardon me, just to yeah. clarify, maybe can you like divide which methods here are uh, deep learning and which are these machine two, vision? These two are deep learning. And the rest is the machine vision. Uh, no, this, these are the frameworks for the pathologists to, uh, to use. Cookup is the program that pathologists often use. So this is like the, this needs a manual, uh, this is not automatic. Like this needs manual uh, input. Uh, Tmarker and uh, Tmarker is also a different program, similar to Kukab, but well, less uh, precise. And this is the um, automatic method from, I think it, it was uh, plugin for image J. So it's also, well, you can see that since it's another program. So this is uh, more oriented with the classic machine vision. This is these two are from the for the uh, deep learning. Uh, they were, of course, you can establish a better deep learning method for that, but you have to increase the amount of data, and you also have to retrain the model for that specific data. Set. So of course, this my method was easier, easiest from these methods to apply for the new data set because it was easier to change two parameters than to retrain the model. So that's why the the scores are here better. Uh, okay, the challenge number three. I was wondering if you could see, but you have very good projector here, so you can see actually here the fibroblast. And what was the problem here for segmenting this cell here that you can see? Uh, the, the halo that you can see here, the bright part in the in, in the, in the on the on the edge of the of the cell. Uh, that was the problem for the classical approach. So we tested a few methods of the deep learning um, and applied to this is the uh, transfer annotation of those cells 
as you can see, marketing in green. And we applied the model of unit and needed. We tested those models. Uh, these are the encoder and decoder methods uh, for the, um, this, this representation. But we also wanted to increase the complexity complex, uh, complexity of the model. Uh, and we uh, tested a few of those. As you can see, the loss was increasing and the accuracy was increasing. So uh, it was quite well performed. The learning was okay. Uh, but we wanted to implement the inception model that the concatenation of different features of different uh, sizes of filters inside the standard unit. As you can see, standard unit is quite simple. But we increase the complexity by, well, adding quite a few blocks here instead of one block, we have like this part. Uh, so this purple for the uh, rectangle is presented here. Like you can see, this is more complex backbone. And as a result, we had very good results, like 97 um, accuracy. Um, this was um, really better than the machine vision approach. So as you can see, uh, there is some pros for the deep learning, even for the, what seems quite obvious uh, approach for the machine vision, it could be easiest done with some search coding algorithm, uh, but it was easier to, to actually um, establish a good deep learning method. Of course, the downside of this approach was that we had to establish a big data set for that. So somebody had to sit through a lot of images and mark them with the boundaries. Okay, challenge number four is the cluster splitting. Okay, so first of all, what are the clusters? So the something like this. And you have cells that are connected and you have to split them to achieve the good quantification result. So this is quite easy, easy, easy cluster for segmentation. This part is quite complex. This is very difficult example. Uh, very hard to um, distinguish separate cells here. And this third image is the is our approach, is the one that I used in the in my PhD that I established. So I tested six methods and uh, none of them met the expectations, so I had to propose something of my own. And I established something uh, like implementation of cluster um, splitting based on some class that I um, appointed to them. So I had four classes of clusters, different classes. So this is the basic example, this is more complex one, the very hard examples and very big clusters like to simplify them. And this is the example of splitting. So we have two clusters here. One is split after one um, going through this. And the other one needs re recurrence um, implementation to really split the whole cluster in separate cells. As you, can, as you can see, the results are quite good. And, the, and again, I compared the, my method, my proposed method with the deep learning methods, the same methods. Uh, and here, as you can see, the, the result of the chain method was quite good, but my proposed method had even better results, slightly better results, um, but it was more clear how it work and the, that's why we use that's why we use this method. This is the proposed method of uh, of cluster splitting. Uh, okay, so the final F score uh, was uh, seven three four versus baseline of six eight six. So it was quite good uh, in three. And then error. Error. Yeah. So, would you give the number? So, it's up and the error? Uh, yeah, this is the. Uh, well, we don't have the number without any errors. We have the baseline that is with uh, not um, without splitting. And the basic deep learning methods, like unit, for example, they do not provide us with the split. Okay. So, this also is very um, 
problematic for the basic segmentation methods of deep learning. Uh, like we have the ability to provide the instant segmentation, like very um, different uh, instances of the cell um, as an output for the deep learning, but this was not tested here. Okay, so we don't have the perfect example here. We have only the baseline as the without the split. Okay, so this noun is without uh, any splitting method. Okay, so this is the, the baseline. Okay, the challenge number five, the last one, the feature architecture this is the newest one, the <laughs> project of uh, my friend that I'm doing the um, engineering part, uh, the <laughs> doctor. Uh, and the implementary microbial lesions. This is, this is the disease that we're talking about here. And what is more important, most important here is that they, there are two groups, IMT and IPT. And one greatly gives metastasis and one does not metastasize. So it's very different treatment here. Yeah, this is a very nasty example here. And the biology area is still not fully understood. So we tackle very specific parts. So we not we do not com compete with the uh, big scientific groups. So the risk factors are there, there are a lot of risk factors, but we focus on increased cellularity and we want to we wanted to check the um, architecture of the tissue. And here as example of the different architecture, which is not really visible. I still have a problem of establishing looking at the tissue. I have the labels by made by pathologists. These are the example of the labels. As you can see, they are quite rough. They are not very specific. Uh, the green one is hypercellular, the blue one is hypercellular parts. And as you can see, they are intertwined. The, there is a lot of places where they are really touching and uh, it's quite difficult to segment them in the images. We use quite old model, the PGG-16, but it's easy to manage in this comprehensible model. As you can see, we have some convolutional layers and we have those filters, right? So we have a few filters here that we can use for explained explainability. So we wanted to use that as an advantage. And for the evaluation team, we use the grant proof in the patch mode because those are too big images to go through the uh, through the net neural network. So we uh, simplify them and we use them as the grant proof in the patch size. Patch size was uh, from 64 to uh, 256. And this is the example of what size of 256. And the classification in three different classes. So we have the hypocellular, the top row, classical, and hypercellular in the low, lowest row. And here we uh, had the deep learning approach, of course, but we didn't like the prediction of, for example, here and here. Like we have the ground proof that uh, for the first class, and this is not established in any of these classes. And so we increased the number of classes or four classes. And we then the, the other class, the fourth class was like the crash, like and any other thing apart from these architectures was put in the in the fourth class. And this provided a better result for the predictions. This is more similar with the grant group, as you can see the false positive rate, uh, number of false positives dropped significantly. And the whole compactness classification for different sizes of patches uh, here presented was all in all above 90%. So quite good results for the classification. And why, what, why we did that in the first place? Well, we wanted to incorporate medical knowledge as the doctors go through this, uh, this issue of the ISDL. They look for the uh, compactness of the of the tissue. They look for the inflammation, adipocytes, and necrosis. Those are uh, we want to establish the area classifier for that, and we want to also find atypia and mitosis with point classifiers. So we want to recreate what pathologists do with these samples, 
and it's not that easy always with the deep learning. It's easier to incorporate medical knowledge with classical um, image processing because we exactly know what we are doing and what we are looking for. In deep learning, you have to really think about how to implement that. So to sum up, the machine vision versus deep learning, it is very task specific. It depends on what you are looking for, what you are doing, and how much time you want to spend on it. So also the amount of data. If you have a, a lot of people to annotate your data, to label your data, it's easier to apply deep learning. But if you, if you have only a few images, it's some it's often better to use classical machine vision. And also resources as in people and also as in machines. If you have GPUs to use and if you have the huge clusters of computers, it's easier to use deep learning than uh, on the simple computer, then it's usually better to use machine vision. So it really depends on what you want to learn from the images or what you are looking for in the images. And the decision is still yours to make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lukas. So now it's the time for questions. Go ahead. I probably have a stupid question because I'm not really in, in machine learning, but you, you talked about image splitting when you wanted to split the image. But if you want to tell a dog from a cat, what will happen if by pure accident your machine is provided with a photo which contains both dog and cat, then the machine will recognize both the properties of the dog and the cat, and the answer it will be something in between, right? Uh, yes. Well, you see my problem? Uh, yes. How I much you think. have to tell first the machine to, to do? Of course. Uh, well, confuse the system. Uh, well, there are methods of actually providing confusion for the algorithm. Because uh, we mm, use something called uh, image augmentation when we uh, make different images from the basic image to increase the number of images that we have. And that's, um, for example, it's blurring, it's uh, cropping, in some parts it's uh, like changing the brightness and, and so on and so on. But when you have the different classes, like when yes. you want to. If I really have by yeah. pure accident two animals different, yes. and then I want to classify, and I didn't tell the computer that there will be more than one animal, what the system will do? There are different um, learning algorithms for classification of one class, like binary classification and multi class classification. So if you want to look for any other, you have to use the multi class learning. So if it is done automatically, the, uh, and the aim is to classify one animal, then the system yeah. will be totally confused no. by having two animals. No, absolutely not. So then the answer will be a dog or a cat or in 50%. If you're dog. using a binary classification and you're looking for a cat and you're giving the image of cat and dog, then it will say that there is a cat. Yeah, but then I have to, to tell the system to look for two animals. If I okay. uh, maybe we postpone the, to, to a later discussion. I understand from what Lukas is saying. I understand. Okay. No, 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 no. It is a very good question. Okay. Thank you. It's a very valid question. I mean, uh, Bojana is astrophysicist, mm -hmm. and obviously, what you are doing with tissues, you can do with the tissue of the universe, so to say, mm -hmm. recognition of different uh, of different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, recognition of different uh, astronomical objects. So uh, to sum up, as far as I understand, so if you have to be still smarter than the machine. Mm -hmm. So if you ask machine to give a binary output, is there a cat or dog? If you have cat, dog, the machine binary is, is, is there a cat or oh, sorry, 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 the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yes or no. So the answer, if you have cats and the whole other zoo, the answer will be yes. But if you expect that your data can uh, contain more objects you have to specify you have to specify and, and, and build a different probability yes. yeah. the, the, the yes. basically yeah, I think that's right. 
I think I think I think that was the answer. Yes. Yeah. So you, you still you still have to use your uh, intelligence. intelligence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, who about first and then. Uh, thank I, you right. for a great presentation, and I got a question. If you need to label the data, how sensitive is your met method to human errors uh, when the, I assume that the pathologist is uh, labeling your data before you use it in both training and test sets? That's my first question. And the second one, would it be better to use a trained pigeon or a trained pathologist uh, at this stage of your research? Thank you. Uh, thank you for those questions. Yeah, the first one, uh, well, as you can see in the, the slides, the, sometimes the annotations are quite rough. And when you have those annotations, you could use some fuzzy methods to really change them and change the boundaries of the, of the uh, annotations and provide that to the network. And the slight changes can actually improve the um, results, but uh, as for the sensitivity for the error, well, we want to minimize the error, of course. But the like few examples of bad classifications should not um, really provide bad results in the whole data sets. For the deep learning, if you have the thousands of images and you have like half percent of bad label. Uh, it should not provide bad results in the end. It should still be high, high accuracy. We want to generalize, generalize the knowledge, so it should not really uh, have that much input. I hope that answers your question. And for the second question, I probably know exactly what you are uh, doing here because there is a paper about pigeons as pathologists. There, there is a paper about uh, trained pigeons that were provided with uh, seeds for the good answer, uh, and the results were surprisingly good. <laughs> <laughs> Probably they will not succeed with pathologists, but uh, I, I don't remember the final results and the final conclusion of that paper. But uh, that that's really worth keeping in mind when when we get the pathologists. <laughs> okay, and now. Uh, Nowadays, actually, in science, when you need to label some larger amount of data, you can ask the general public. You can create a citizen science project, and the Galaxy Zoo is for such an example, in, in order to teach machines to recognize various shapes of galaxies, first uh, people were asked to analyze images. And they did it very effectively, and that was used as an input to machine learning algorithms. So, as your images resemble shapes, let me say, the average person can use uh, this fantastic uh, property of human brain to, to recognize shapes on the one thing, right? And eventually provide labeling. If you engage 20,000 people all over the world, you will have your sample that. In, in, in a couple of weeks at, 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 at most. So that, that could be a, an idea how to gain qualitatively high uh, level samples. Because then, of course, you don't have to rely on a single classification, but you do statistical distribution. Now, some people do it wrong, but some people do it right. And you, but I have another past two questions. First, Computer-assisted assisted analysis of medical images, that has already a long history, right? Although I am aware about application in a different area like X-ray imaging or, or MMR or something like that. How do those methods compare to what you are doing? And the second question was, uh, is it possible that that is uh, population specific? If you develop technique and that, that has would have to be recalibrated for Africa or for China. Thank you for the question, the comment. Uh, regarding the, that comment, uh, I've seen a few papers actually about the, the applying of the population, and the, I think they are called TERPs or something like that for the um, for the mass produced uh, labeling data. It's easier for the um, for 
distinguishing simple single cells and the, for the detection task, but for, for example, the, the differentiation of architecture in the tissue, well, this is very specific. This is really pathologist knowledge here, like this is different architectures. I don't see that. Okay. I, I think the, I do, yes. the general idea is that this, is, this has to be done by the specialist. But of course, the segmentation of simple cells, the mm, detection of the cells, that could be provided by the, by the population. The only problem is money. Like you have to pay for that. And you have to apply for grants for that. And it's, it's not that common in, in pathology, but it, it could be done, yes. Uh, so that's the future idea for the for the grant program. Uh, for the question, mm, uh, for your question about the uh, recali recalibration, uh, yes, definitely. These are very specific for the data set. But as I said before, uh, the whole deep learning is about the generalization of knowledge. So we, yes, we also as the department are taking data from different parts of Europe or different parts from the globe to really generalize the knowledge and to have the algorithm that will work in different scenarios. It's difficult. It's probably not achievable at this moment to generalize it for the whole globe, but this is the, this is the idea to, uh, to tackle that problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, more questions? From the audience. Uh, if not, maybe there are some questions online. Okay. Professor Tursky, yes, please. You have to unmute your mic, please, Professor Tursky. Microphone. Microphone. Professor Tursky, microphone. We cannot hear you. Sorry, I don't hear us. Well, well I, don't know. I think he hears. No. No, no, no. Please unmute the microphone. Can you? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yes, finally we can. At all, we cannot. <laughs> I'm sorry, we can't. Am I, am I on the air or uh, should I shut up? On the air, please go. Uh, I, I have a question which is partly answered already, but nevertheless, uh, I'm a little bit bothered with this uh, frame of formulating the issue of recognizing uh, objects by the artificial intelligence. And let me give you an example. In the information theory, at this in the early days, there was a concept whether the information you want to process or understand is heralded or unheralded. And um, the same is with the recognizing objects. Suppose you are searching a, a desert in Tasmania, and you have a device which will look for the wolves. And there are normal wolves. Supposedly, somebody brought to Tasmania also the European wolves, and they had survived. And they are the de devils of Tasmania, this uh, womp kind of wolf. And uh, suppose your optical device and your staining device recognize the wolves if this is an animal which has four legs, a tail, and a particular kind of teeth and everything. And even if you will see the wolf, which have exactly all these parameters detected by your artificial intelligence, which are the same between the normal wolf and the devil of Tasmania, you will only be able to tell the difference if you will see the pairs of the wolves. Because the difference in the wolves of Tasmania, of these devils of Tasmania from the wolves of Europe are in the sex, is sex difference. The female wolf has the container to carry the newly born animal. And it might not be something which your device is able to detect in whatever way. And neural networks or the not neural networks, it will never able, will be never able to understood that we have to 
two completely different objects before us, although they looked at, at exactly the same and there is no information theory tricks which will recognize unless you study the internal structure of that object. So uh, if, you, if you take a blood sample and if some crazy scientist will create the red cell, which is poisonous because something is planted inside of the red cell and outside that red cell will look identical. It will be stated identical with your chemical tricks and it will be recognized as a red cell and then will kill the patient anyway. So uh, we have to be extremely carefully with the using the words recognizing, discovering, because they carry the connotation that if you do this artificial intelligence test or whatever kind of other test, and uh, you will be always able to tell the truth. No, the truth is only with certain probability truths in those experiments. And that, what is the probability of the results you mentioned has not been as far as I was able to understand the the lecture even mentioned. The other thing is that it might not be in a very good shape today. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas, for the comment. Yes, uh, I kind of agree with Professor. Uh, I'm a big fan of machine vision, and uh, I, I I tend to use the deep learning, but with some precautions. Uh, but, well, the, the whole idea of recognition, and it, it is the, the percentage of the probability that we are uh, recognizing something as something else, like putting a label on it. Uh, this uh, probably I forgot to mention it during this long presentation, uh, but um, it really depends on the data that we put for the deep learning. If we provide enough information, we can hope for and then the right results. That's the only comment we can give for the approach. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions? If not the case, let's thank Lucas again. 